Whoops. Or <laughs> don't start joining, that yet. <laughs> for joining us here. Um, um, to kind of introduce, my name is Jimmy Hua. I'm the founder and co-president of Asian Leaders Alliance, uh, which I believe all you guys, everyone here on the call has been able to learn about this. Today is actually kind of an interesting day. We're actually trying to kick off a series called A Sneak Peek. Um, one of the things that to let everyone know what the goals of Asian Leaders Alliance is, one of our goals is to help the Asian ERGs to get content, to get connected to the community to be able to um, have content and materials, but also opportunities for your ERG and also for your employees of your ERGs. So we're kicking off this new series called Sneak Peek, where we will actually have um, organizations come and talk about their organization so that you could learn more about them and be able to have them do the same presentation for your employees or try to find a, another thing you could do together to try to help these organizations. Um, so that being said, today we have actually kind of a cool thing here is um, we're actually here talking about San Francisco Chinatown. Yes, we are talking about the Chinatown of San Francisco, but we're also talking about a book called San Francisco Chinatown. And it is a pretty much a book of pictures and images that actually um, Dick Evans here, who's actually on the call, has been taking pictures of. He's done two other prior books in other areas in San Francisco that's been very popular. But this time he did it for Chinatown. And one of the most important things is Chinatown has a lot of history. So he actually partnered with Kathy here to actually use the, the images that he took and have a story in history that Kathy helped write and produce for that. And so we're really in a good spot to get both Kathy and Dick here on the call to actually talk more about their book, but also to give us an insight about Chinatown and the history around Chinatown. So I'm gonna actually kick it off to Dick to take over. And again, thank you very much for everyone for attending. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jimmy. Uh, it's, it's very appreciated that you organized this opportunity. And uh, thank you to all of those leaders who were on the call. Uh, we appreciate you attending. And as we get toward the end, we'll open it up uh, so that you can actually ask direct live questions so that you can uh, interact and, and uh, ask anything you want. <clears throat> what we plan to do today is give you uh, pretty much the similar format that we have been using for other book talks. Uh, we've done something over 15 book talks uh, at this point from uh, every venue like the San Francisco Main Library, uh, all virtual of course, uh, to employee, Asian uh, employee groups for Google and Facebook, for example, and then many other varied organizations. Uh, so before we go into the narrated slideshow that Kathy and I will do, we have a short two minute trailer that gives you a synopsis. Uh, and I'm gonna ask uh, Laura, who's our uh, tech manager on this to please go ahead and play the trailer if you would.
Okay, uh, I should mention that this uh, book project is a nonprofit project. Uh, in other words, all the benefits of any revenue from book sales all go to nonprofits that were associated with the project. And in particular, uh, the Chinese Culture Center in Chinatown and also Heyday Books, which is a nonprofit book publisher in Berkeley. Uh, so let's move into the narrated slideshow. Uh, what you see here uh, is a classic and iconic image of what we think of when we think of San Francisco Chinatown. Uh, it's a shot of Grant Avenue with the uh, Chinese architecture, the curio shops, the red lanterns uh, looking, uh, in this case, looking north down Grant Avenue. Uh, and the uh, facades of these buildings are quite colorful. Uh, and in fact, we chose one of those facades to be the cover of the book, uh, which you see in the next image here. Uh, this was, uh, is quite a historic building. It used to be home to the uh, very well-known Four Seas restaurant. The sign is in fact still there, but the restaurant hasn't been there for years. But the building now does house uh, one of the new very upscale restaurants, Mr. Jews, which is uh, the only restaurant in Chinatown that carries a Michelin star uh, at this point. Here's another iconic image along Grant Avenue, the pagoda style buildings uh, on the rooftops and the historical street lamps. Now, for many of us, we think of this as being historic Chinatown, as this being what Chinatown always looked like, but that's not at all true. And Chinatown really began in the mid 1800s, uh, around 1850, when there was an influx of immigrants coming in, uh, first triggered by the gold mining rush, and then second by the railroad building. So thousands of Chinese immigrants came in uh, during those mid 1800s. Uh, many went on to the mines and railroads, but others settled in uh, what was in the center of San Francisco, uh, right around Portsmouth Square, and what is what we now know as Chinatown along Grant Avenue. And the buildings and architecture look nothing like this, even though we think of this as being the historic Chinatown. Uh, it was really simply uh, low rise, low cost, uh, almost shanty towns, and, and essentially what we would call a ghetto. I think today, unsanitary conditions, crowded uh, housing conditions. But when the 1906 earthquake and then the subsequent fires that consumed much of San Francisco occurred, uh, it was a question of either moving Chinatown to the outskirts of the city, which some of the uh, city fathers wanted to do because that real estate in the center of the city was quite valuable. Uh, but the residents of Chinatown resisted that and were able to negotiate a, a constructive agreement where they would stay physically in the same location, but would agree to have Chinatown rebuilt as a combination tourist center and or tourist attraction and residential neighborhood. Uh, so that's when these buildings, the pagoda style roofs and the, uh, the other accoutrements that we think of today as being Chinatown uh, were all constructed in that period. Um, now the uh, immigration to San Francisco and to California was not an easy move uh, for most of the immigrants that came. And they mostly, uh, after the earthquake, uh, they came through Angel Island uh, which was set up very much like Ellis Island was uh, on the uh, East Coast for immigrants. Uh, and this was during a period when there was uh, a law, which you may have heard of, called the Chinese Exclusion Act, a very blatant, overt law uh, prohibiting uh, or heavily restricting Chinese immigration. Uh, so naturally, when, when people came, they often were quarantined or held out at Angel Island in some uh, barracks. And while they were there, many of them carved 
something into the wood of the uh, barracks, the walls, the bunk bed uh, structures, and carved, of course, in Chinese characters. Um, but there has been a project uh, a few years ago to, to capture all of those stories, translate them into English. And let me just read this one because I think it's a little, a little bit chilling in today's environment. Everybody's got a number. I think my number is 80340. They would put your number on the blackboard and you know that you have to go to interrogation or a health checkup. They didn't use names. On the day that they let you go, your number is on the blackboard and it says San Francisco. This was carved into the uh, wood wall by a young man, 11 years old in 1939. Now history did not stop uh, with the Chinese Exclusion Act, which ended uh, and the other uh, forms of more overt discrimination, which ended in only the 1950s. Uh, the history has continued to evolve. There are two statues in Chinatown today that I think of are of note and speak uh, much more strongly to more recent social justice issues. You might recognize this first one if you have ever seen film or remember, uh, if you're my age, remember seeing live the images from Tiananmen Square in 1989. There was a statue called the Goddess of Democracy uh, for which you see a replica here. And in Tiananmen Square, it was 50 feet tall, made of wood, cardboard, and paper. Uh, but here, this is a replica of that statue made out of bronze, approximately 10 feet tall. And it sits right in the middle of Portsmouth Square, which of course is the heart of uh, Chinatown and also uh, like the backyard of Chinatown where people gather to play cards, uh, read newspapers, chat, visit with each other. The other statue is in St. Mary's Square, which is actually quite a small square uh, next to St. Mary's Cathedral, uh, which is a Chinese Christian church that is one of the few buildings that survived the 1906 earthquake. Uh, this statue is even more recent and it relates to, it's a tribute actually, to the comfort women in World War II. And those were the young women and girls uh, who were kidnapped and used as sex slaves for the Japanese soldiers uh, during World War II. Many of them uh, died in the process. There were some survivors, uh, but it was a, a terrible treatment of uh, of those young uh, women. Uh, this statue, which uh, only was unveiled a few years ago, uh, tributes is a tribute to those young women. There are three nationalities represented in the statue. One is Chinese, one is Korean, and one is Filipino. Uh, so these, both of these statues, I think, speak uh, to the more current issues uh, and of course, there are many other issues that Chinatown is uh, dealing with. But the reason to give a, a brief history of Chinatown is so that you recognize the history of Chinatowns is, is really a history of resilience and survival, and also a history of celebration, as you'll see, because many cultural traditions have been carried forward and there are numerous celebrations and festivals throughout the year. In the course of doing this book project, we, I took, uh, I think about 5,000 photos of which maybe 250 are in the book. Uh, a few hundred more are on the website for the book. But Kathy also interviewed uh, over 100 uh, people, uh, everything from business owners to activists to uh, leaders in the community. Uh, so Kathy, do you want to share some of your experiences and learnings from that? Sure. Well, you have here in this next slide, James Leong's mural, no, no relative, but this is the um, famous artist, James Leong. And he was commissioned this mural to cover 100 years of Chinese in America. Well, after it was produced in Hong, the Chinese in the community criticized it because they said it reinforced stereotypes 
even though it was historically accurate. So the rejection hurt this artist so badly that he fled the United States altogether and he set up shop in Europe. And that were, is where he spent the remainder of his career. So it was lost and later recovered in a Chinatown rec room. There are seven panels. And one of the panels was used as a ping pong table. You can see it today all together now at the um, Chinese Historical Society of America Museum. And that is where James Leong returned to retouch the mural and was welcomed back with honor. In front of the mural on the left is Sue Lee. She's an expert in Chinese American history. So what's the significance here? Like a detective, she recovered a set of 12 extremely rare watercolors by the late Jake Lee. The original works once hung in the elegant Khan's restaurant in Chinatown. And after Khan's was sold in the 1990s, the paintings, all 12, mysteriously disappeared until Sue hunted them down and brought them back together. So the shared history of Chinatown naturally has led to a shared culture as well. And the biggest cultural event of the year is clearly Lunar New Year, a week-long celebration that is capped by the Lunar New Year parade and which is now a destination tourism event. Uh, the celebration capped by the parade is typically attended by hundreds of thousands a year now. And if you've never gone and are in the Bay Area and have an opportunity, I would strongly encourage you. It's quite an event, a great event for families, also a great event for photography uh, because it's so uh, colorful and uh, so much going on. Uh, as you can see here, lions and dragons abound along the parade, uh, but also accompanied by floats, uh, marching bands, um, and also uh, a group of stilt walkers, uh, which here you see a couple of uh, these young boys dressed in uh, monkey king costumes who are stilt walkers who actually traverse the mile long parade route on stilts, uh, as well as this young woman uh, who's also dressed in costume. Uh, they're elementary students actually from West Portal Elementary School and have been doing this for quite a number of years. And I might mention if you are interested in photography uh, and you do attend Chinese Year, uh, New Year Parade, uh, by all means, get there a couple hours early and go down to the staging area, which is only a few blocks away on Market Street, uh, because that's where you can get the best pictures. Everyone's getting their costumes uh, tweaked, getting ready, getting in position, having snacks before the mile long walk. And uh, this picture and the, the prior one of the two boys were taken uh, there. During uh, uh, Chinese New Year, of course, uh, the celebration revolves around the uh, year of the uh, Zodiac. And in this case, these were photos taken in 2019. Uh, so costumed uh, young uh, boys and girls were handing out uh, candy in these little plastic piglets because that was the year of the pig. There are, of course, other festivals uh, throughout the year in Chinatown. Another big one uh, is the Moon Festival, which takes place in the fall and actually uh, just uh, took place uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and what you see here, a picture of the moon goddess and her uh, god or best man here. Uh, the woman on the left is Maggie Wong. She's a TV personality, uh, journalist, uh, has been around Chinatown for many years and has been the uh, goddess of the Moon Festival for I think the last 20, also, although she told me she's now planning to retire after 20 years. She wants to hand that off uh, to someone else. But um, as you can see, they attend many events in costume uh, and uh, it's just a terrific opportunity uh, to uh, meet them, take pictures and so on. 
today, yeah, today if Bruce Lee was alive, um, he would be 80 years old. And this uh, was really important for young men in the 1970s, early, late 60s, because before he arrived on the scene, there were no male role models of Chinese in the media. If they were on television, they would be uh, playing evil emperors or houseboys or expendable railroad workers. If white people played lead Chinese roles, they would be with taped eyes and they would be speaking English in stereotypic Chinese accents. Now, Bruce Lee changed the life of this man on the left. This is Jeff Chin. So when Jeff was a boy in Daly City and went to school, he was picked on mercilessly. He secretly wished he was white. It was really rough on him. And one day after a particularly awful day at school, he lay in bed and he looked at the Bruce Lee poster on his wall. And he really believes that Bruce Lee seemed to reach out to him speaking to him, telling him, don't give up, there's hope. And from that night on, he changed. He vowed to Bruce Lee that he would one day make him proud. Well, today he is um, an expert in martial arts. He is also one of the world's top collectors of Bruce Lee memorabilia with over 10,000 items. His collection is so famous, it has toured around the world it has gone to Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And next year, it is supposed to debut at the Chinese Historical Society of America Museum. So watch for it next year. Next, we're here at Skylon Memorial Park in San Mateo. And I call it the Ritz-Carlton of cemeteries. Every spring, Taoist priests and families come by the busload during Qingming which is a holiday to honor dead ancestors. Dick and I got a tour of the manicure premises during uh, Qingming. This, they have amazing vistas here and what a contrast. In the 1800s, Chinese could not be buried in the same cemeteries as the whites. They were pushed outside of San Francisco to be buried. During the course of the uh, project, which lasted about two and a half years, uh, gathering all of the uh, interviews and photographs together, we discovered that there is actually an international Tai Chi day. Uh, and luckily, uh, we learned about it a couple of weeks before it was due to occur. Uh, and we had wanted to include some photographs of Tai Chi in the book and a description of it. So uh, we worked with the Chinese Culture Center and offered anyone who wanted to show up uh, some free pastries and tea, if they would show up on, I think it was a Sunday morning, uh, around 10 o'clock at the Kearney Street Bridge. And sure enough, we had a nice turnout, as you can see here. Uh, and we also uh, were able to have the woman in front, who is a Tai Chi instructor, uh, lead the group in a class, and then a number of poses on the bridge uh, right by Portsmouth Square. Also during the course of the project, uh, we were very lucky to discover this woman who is a Tai Chi master. Uh, and it was uh, sort of indirect how we discovered her. Uh, we had gone to an herbalist shop because we wanted some photos of an herbalist shop and an herbalist in the book. Uh, and while we were there chatting with him and taking his photos, we noticed some large three or four foot high statues on top of his herbal cabinets. Uh, and we were curious and asked him, uh, you know, did they sponsor like a dragon boat or a, maybe a, a, a baseball team or something, or where did the trophies come from? And he said, no, those belong to my wife. Uh, and she's won them in Tai Chi competitions and is in fact a Sifu or a Tai Chi master. Uh, so naturally we wanted to speak with her uh, she was there working in the office. She came out, chatted with us, and agreed to come back in a couple of weeks uh, and go around parts of Chinatown and do some various Tai Chi poses in front of iconic uh, buildings or uh, well-known street corners or, in this case, in front of a mural. Uh, so she did that. We got uh, dozens of terrific photographs of her in her bright pink outfit 
uh, in doing all of these various uh, Tai Chi poses. We're here with the Tong family at Chinatown's Far East Cafe. At every red egg and ginger party, um, which is a baby party for a one month old baby, you have to have dyed red eggs to represent fertility and a plate of ginger to represent energy and strength. I think it's kids who love Chinese New Year the most. And you typically give two red envelopes filled with two fresh bills because this represents double happiness. Typically when a girl grows up, gets engaged, uh, the bride-to-be will order a custom tailored changsam to wear for the wedding. Meanwhile, the wedding tea ceremony is a treasured tradition, but fewer and fewer Chinese couples are honoring it, except for Liana and Michael, who are the exception. They will present tea to their elders, and in turn, the parents and grandparents, one couple at a time, offer them money and jewelry. Now, brides aren't the only ones who receive jewelry. Many times, an older woman will start handing down her heirlooms to her grandchildren, daughter, or daughter-in-law when she feels the time is right. In ancient times, people believed if you wore a 24 karat gold necklace or jade bracelet, you would be protected from evil spirits. And this is what makes Chinese jewelry so unique because it's not just ornamental. It, people really believed um, it possessed powers and it's been used as money during times of war. Now, I love this mural and unfortunately it's been painted over, but it represents everyday Chinatown life. Here, a modern woman passes a traditional tailor shop. She wears a traditional jade bracelet, probably handed down from her mother or grandmother. She carries a bag of good luck oranges and a box of bakery treats for a sweet life. And she's probably going to visit her auntie. A family sharing dim sum, this is my family, is also known as going to yum cha, and it's a common memory for American born Chinese. Little plates of chicken feet, steamed tripe and gizzards are not exotic, but everyday dishes. Chinatown has a very strong sense of community uh, and you never uh, feel that any stronger than if you take a walk through Portsmouth Square. Uh, and in this case, I was uh, in Portsmouth Square. It was a sunny day originally, and I was uh, taking some photos of the women playing cards and the men playing mahjong and, and all the other activities going on in Portsmouth Square. And it suddenly clouded over uh, and just started to pour. Uh, so I thought, well, the photo shoot's over. I started to gather up my photography gear and head for the car. Uh, but then I noticed that the card groups didn't uh, stop at all. They just uh, held on to their hands, opened their umbrellas and moved over under the uh, part of the bridge structure, which gave them protection from the rain, uh, kept their umbrellas out and the card games continued. Uh, but uh, that gives you a good sense of uh, the community spirit. Here's another a typical shot. This is inside. This is inside a Family Benevolent Association on a, a Saturday morning. Uh, and it's quite typical uh, for members to come there, men and women. There were other tables in which women or mixed groups were, were playing cards and uh, mahjong and Chinese checkers and chess. Uh, but also there's a reading room with a number of Chinese uh, language newspapers uh, or people just coming there to chat and connect on a Saturday morning. Another uh, event in which there's a strong community spirit is Miss Chinatown USA. Uh, now, it is actually open to young women uh, from all around the US, uh, Chinatowns all around the US, uh, although it's headquartered in San Francisco and the pageant and event takes place in San Francisco. Uh, and we wanted to understand a little bit more about why there is a Miss Chinatown pageant uh, you know, why they don't just participate in uh, Miss America or other uh, pageants and what it's about. And in this case, uh, we learned 
that the history is that for decades, young Chinese women were both overtly and uh, covertly discouraged from participating in Miss America uh, competitions and other similar competitions. So that's the genesis of having developed it uh, for a Miss Chinatown USA. Uh, now the young woman you see here named Catherine Wu, in the prior photograph you saw her working with some students in a bilingual school. Uh, and we visited when she came there to uh, read in both Chinese and English, uh, to talk about the value of being bilingual uh, and to interact with the students. We also learned during uh, the course of meeting her that she was an Olympic level world-class archer. And in fact, was hoping to participate in the 2019 Olympic games in Tokyo. Unfortunately, as you know, the Olympic games last year were canceled. So she never got that opportunity. Uh, but we did invite her to, to come uh, and bring her bow and arrows, uh, which as you see is a very elaborate, uh, complicated uh, uh, bow structure. Uh, and uh, with the uh, counterweight sticking out the front to steady the aim uh, and took some photos of her uh, around various places uh, in San Francisco. Another community institution is the YMCA and very similar to the Miss Chinatown pageant. There is a Chinatown YMCA for the same reason. Uh, Chinese families were both overtly and quietly discriminated against and discouraged or even prohibited from using YMCAs around the city. Uh, so their solution was to work with the Y to organize a YMCA in Chinatown, uh, which you see here uh, with the beautiful mosaic uh, mural that uh, is by the pool. It's also the same reason why you see a Chinese hospital in Chinatown because the population is not large enough on its own to justify a hospital. But again, when you cannot get access to services uh, that others have privy to, uh, then you create your own. And in this case, uh, there has been a Chinese hospital for many years, but it was completely rebuilt recently, about uh, oh, five to seven years ago, and is a beautiful modern facility. This is actually the donor wall that you see here with names of all of those uh, who contributed to the building of the new hospital. Uh, and as you draw your eyes back just a little bit, you'll see that's in the shape of a dragon actually on the side of the hospital. Now, Tolan Town is a densest neighborhood outside of Manhattan. It's only one fifth of a square mile and houses anywhere between 15,000 to 30,000 inhabitants. So imagine your home the size of a closet and that closet shared with four other people. Welcome to single renter occupancy or SRO apartment living. Here with no access to washers or dryers, you have to hand wash and hang your clothes outside to dry. And you share a restroom and kitchen with all your neighbors. One of Chinatown's heroes is the Reverend Norman Fong, the former executive director of the Chinatown Community Development Center. Now on the day this photo was taken, a young lady who lived in the SRO building ran up to him and asked if he could visit her grandmother. Because the grandmother was too sick to walk down the stairs because there's no elevator, the family just wanted Reverend Wong Fong to come and pray with her. So with compassion and tenderness, he took both of her hands in his and whispered a prayer in Cantonese. Now today, you're on the Dragon Boat Racing Team from Community Youth Center. All your gear, all your practice time is free of charge. Thanks to the nonprofit CYC, the sport is transforming the lives of at-risk kids who might be tempted to join the wrong crowd. This is Bella Chen, and she admits she was unathletic before joining the team. Now she's the team captain. And today, many Chinese kids are very proud of their heritage. Yuhan Chen, only six at the time, picks up a brush for the very first time 
during this Chinese New Year event. And she finds out she really excels at Chinese calligraphy. Tyler Pham, my nephew, samples Dragon Beard candy, making a beard of his own. Dragon Beard was originally a dessert of ancient Chinese emperors made from a solid block of syrup and handful to form thousands of strands. Now these colorful buildings are not just ornamental. They belong to family associations and there's more than 200 of them in Chinatown. Back in the 1800s, if you landed in Chinatown, you would look up your association based on your village or your last name. And then the association would help you secure a place to stay and job. Many of these associations feature shrines. Note that these are private clubhouses, not open to outsiders. So getting in to take pictures for a book like ours was extremely rare. Last year, a play called King of the Yees about family associations came to San Francisco. The comedy was written by Lauren Yee, who grew up in Chinatown and spent many years attending association functions. The largest of these is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. It consists of more than 50,000 members throughout the United States and Canada. Recently, they worked with local officials to block marijuana shops from coming into Chinatown. Now, the largest problem facing them today is future leadership. Because they're headed by elderly men, most sons are not involved in this um, and they do not allow women to be leaders. Here we have another hero, Cecilia Chang. She recently passed away at 100 years old and she was a famous restaurateur who was also considered the Julia Child of Chinese cooking. Back in 1968, she opened the very first elegant and successful Chinese restaurant called the Mandarin based in Ghirardelli Square, not Chinatown. And why not? Because she was blocked from going there because she didn't speak Cantonese, she was from Shanghai, and because she was a woman. Many years later, her son caught the restaurant bug as well. And you may be familiar with PF Chains, which has restaurants all over the world. Now in the 1800s, Chinese schools were erected in Chinatown because parents feared their children would lose their language and culture of the homeland. The youth spoke Cantonese, the language of the Guangdong province, where most of the Chinese were from at the time. But now most children are learning Mandarin, the national language of China. Music and dance of a number of forms from formal Chinese opera to Forbidden City Follies to aerobic and energetic lion dances play an important part in Chinatown's identity. Uh, here you see a young man setting up the backdrops for a Chinese opera performance. Uh, and then in the next slide you see uh, in the dressing room, and I might mention I was privileged to get the ability to go into the dressing room three hours before the opera started, because that's when the uh, performers start uh, and complete putting on their makeup. Uh, so I was able to photograph from uh, the beginning to end of all the makeup and costuming that goes on before the play ever starts. Um, and here you see uh, actually uh, one of the sort of the final act in the play itself. Uh, but having uh, spent three hours seeing them uh, put on the makeup and costumes, you really appreciate uh, the performance once you see that. And I might mention, I did ask uh, the performers, okay, it took three hours to put on your makeup, to put on your costume. How long does it take to take it off afterwards? Uh, and they said uh, 10 or 15 minutes and we can't wait. <laughs> uh, so it's a little easier taking it off than putting it on. Uh, another uh, form of uh, dance and singing and performance is the Grant or the Grant Avenue Follies. Uh, now, these this is a group of women who, uh, a number of years ago, probably forty or fifty years ago, were actual 
burlesque dancers, singers, performers, while China, when Chinatown was in its glory days uh, in uh, performing arts in uh, the uh, Chinatown itself. Uh, now they've reorganized under the leadership of uh, Cynthia Yi and the same women who were dancers back then are now putting on performances, uh, burlesque style uh, performances, singing, dancing, uh, and primarily doing it for uh, nonprofit benefits and to help groups like veterans groups and others. Uh, but they put on a terrific performance and are quite well known. Uh, and also it demonstrates that uh, dance is for life uh, because you can see that they're very fit and able to put on an hour to an hour and a half uh, nonstop performance. Um, uh, yeah, another form of dance, of course, is lion dance. And I'm going to hand it over to Kathy uh, to talk a little bit about that. Moving a 10 pound lion head to mimic a real lion is really actual work. And if you haven't practiced, your arms won't even last you through a whole parade. In this slide, we see Corey Chan, and we've kind of nicknamed him the Lionhead Whisperer. For over 40 years, he's been restoring and repairing injured lion heads and give them back their roar. He's just simply self-taught. He replaces eyelid strings used for blinking. He glues on new fur. He paints over scratches until the lion looks like new. And after repairs, Corey says, new memories come back to the lion. Now, aren't these stunning? And incidentally, those photos were taken in his garage. Uh, his cars have no uh, right to the garage. That's reserved for lion heads. <laughs> so, it's quite a collection. I would guess there must have been how many, Kathy? Maybe 30 or 40, I suppose. At least 20. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if I could, uh, Laura, if I could ask you to uh, open everybody's microphones now. Uh, we're about five minutes from the end. Uh, and uh, that way, uh, we'll go uh, right into the Q&A. Uh, you can also, of course, uh, type in a Q&A or type in a comment on the chat. And also, uh, Laura, if you would uh, ping uh, Jimmy, because he asked if we would ping him uh, uh, within five minutes or 10 minutes of when we're going to uh, get to the Q&A. Uh, so to many uh, visitors and residents as well, Chinatown is uh, just not complete unless you make a stop at a restaurant or a bakery or a food market. Uh, and over the three year book project, while I was there many times, I, I would hardly ever get out of Chinatown without stopping for dim sum or stopping at the bakery or picking up something to take home for dinner. Uh, in fact, there's a best-selling book titled The Woman Who Ate Chinatown, a San Francisco Odyssey, uh, which was written by the late Shirley Fong uh, Torres. Now, many people have their favorite restaurant, like a local restaurant uh, that you might see here, often with roasted ducks hanging in the window, as you see. Uh, and roasted ducks are probably never going to go away in the restaurant scene in Chinatown, but they... Uh, but the restaurants are changing. And you see in this next photo, uh, I think you'll see uh, again, uh, roasted ducks, but in this case, uh, in a very different type of open floor plan, spacious, I would almost call it a Napa Valley style ambiance, a Chinese restaurant called China Live, which opened three or four years ago. Uh, and it was founded by uh, George Chen and his uh, wife, Cindy. Uh, it was a significant uh, monetary investment for them remodeling and creating this multi-store restaurant. As you can see, the kitchens are just uh, superb, open, well-lit, uh, very well-appointed, well-staffed. Uh, and uh, you see, uh, uh, you know, great equipment like uh, these giant uh, steamers. Uh, uh, and then uh, my favorite here, the giant uh, chocolate mousse bowl that this young woman has. Uh, 
China Live's not the only new upscale Chinese restaurant in uh, the Chinatown area. I mentioned this one at the beginning. This is Mr. Chu's. The chef is Brandon Chu. Uh, it is the one uh, restaurant in Chinatown that has a Michelin star and is located uh, right in the center of Chinatown, uh, right on Grant Avenue. Uh, and you see in this shot uh, uh, a sample of their very uh, precise uh, settings and uh, meal presentations. Uh, and Kathy and I had the uh, uh, benefit of having lunch there the other day. Uh, they are open outside and had a terrific uh, uh, lunch. Uh, this is another uh, a young chef, Kathy Fang, uh, whose parents were in the restaurant business and still are in Chinatown, uh, but she branched out her, on her own. Uh, she's won a number of awards for her in, inventive cuisine and her uh, restaurant called Fang Restaurant. Now this happy employee works at Mao Li Sheng Ki. It's a business of dried meats and poultry and it's over 100 years old, spanning seven generations. Yum. Raise your hand if you ever had dried salted fish or hong yi. I love it. When I stayed at my grandmother's house when I was a child, Popo steamed this over rice for breakfast. And coffee crunch cake, anyone? Eastern Bakery is only one of two bakeries in San Francisco making this Chinese uh, fantastic confection. The other is in Japantown. Now in Stockton Street, known as the locals Chinatown, every day at 4 p.m., little Chinese ladies emerge from her SRO apartments and they come out for the produce on sale. Yat man yat bao, one dollar, one bag. Now there's one thing that unites us Chinese through the ages. We all love a good bargain. Now what are these dried roots and fungi used for? These are ingredients in healthy family soup recipes. You take a fistful of this, finger full of that, and soup can clear your acne. It can fortify your chi. It can improve your circulation. A traditional Cantonese mother cooks soup every day for her family. However, I am not a traditional Chinese mother. In addition to the uh, small restaurants and the food markets, uh, there are a number of other uh, small family businesses and entrepreneurs in Chinatown. Uh, and I think no one is, is probably more entrepreneurial, more harder working and determined than 82-year-old Tain Chen, who you see here, who founded, owns, and operates the walk shop on Grant Avenue. Uh, and even during the COVID shutdown, fortunately, uh, she's been able to work six or seven days a week handling the online orders and keeping the lights on. Uh, so they're one business that I think is going to survive uh, through the COVID crisis. There's many types of different businesses. I mentioned earlier the uh, the woman who was the Tai Chi master. Well, this is her husband, who's the herbalist. Uh, you can see his uh, shelves of herbs in the back. Um, here you see a florist in Ross Alley uh, with her, uh, all of her uh, flowers. Uh, a studio photographer that's, that's taken uh, uh, many photos. And it's interesting, on his walls, he has photos he's taken of uh, I'd say four or five different presidents of the United States, governors, mayors, uh, uh, athletes, and others who have uh, come and visited Chinatown. Uh, here's an acupuncturist. Uh, we were able to meet him, go behind the scenes, meet his wife, uh, talk to him, understand uh, his business much better. He's posing here with his uh, mannequin with all of the uh, uh, the key points of the body identified. Uh, and here you see uh, next are a couple of photos that relate to businesses that are specifically targeting uh, the tourist trade. Uh, this is a tea uh, sales and tasting center where you can uh, you know, uh, sit down, taste multiple teas, learn all about tea, uh, and they have fabulous selection of all the different teas. And of course you can buy uh, the tea as well. 
Uh, this is a classic uh, jade carvings boutique. Uh, this is one business that's, that's probably struggling, these businesses. There used to be many of them on Grand Avenue. There are fewer now. And uh, with the advent of online shopping, I think it's hurt this business probably a bit more than some of the others. Uh, but there are still several very nice shops as you uh, see here. And similar to what I mentioned on about the restaurant scene, you also see an emergence of some upscale, quite contemporary clothing and boutique gift shops now. Uh, so this is one, this is actually on the same premises as China Live. So it's the China Live gift shop. Uh, and all of the goods that are for sale here were curated by Cindy Chen, the chef's wife. Uh, she traveled throughout China, throughout Asia, throughout Europe, uh, picking out what she thought was the best in craftsmanship uh, to have at the shop. And it really is a great shop uh, in case you're looking for something quite unique and very high quality. Uh, everything from uh, uh, teas and herbal remedies to pottery, to cooking utensils, to uh, books and, and other, uh, uh, many other gifts. Here is another upscale contemporary boutique. This one is in the clothing business. Uh, it is called Kim Plus Ono, which is a play on words of the word kimono, of course. Uh, and it sells upscale hand-painted silk kimonos and other uh, clothing. In fact, uh, they held the uh, opening for the uh, Moon Festival last year in the Kim Plus Ono space because it's such a nice space uh, and encouraged people to come uh, in costume uh, based on the theme of Crazy Rich Asians, the movie that was so popular a year or two ago. Uh, so this is one of the participants. And the final image that uh, I'd like to show you is also the back cover of the book. Uh, and it's a photograph that I took of a mural in one of the new restaurants, a restaurant called Dim Sum Corner, which is on uh, right on Grant Avenue uh, and specializes, uh, as you would expect, with on Dim Sum. Um, but uh, they have this mural sort of in a back hallway. And we just love the mural because we think it captures the essence of uh, Chinatown today. You've got uh, a contemporary young woman uh, with a modern camera, uh, this graphic arts vibe of the mural, and yet she's wearing this very traditional uh, red dress. Uh, so in our view, this is uh, uh, much like Chinatown is today. Uh, it's a good representation of uh, confidence, uh, being uh, modern and contemporary, uh, and looking forward uh, in a positive way. So with that, uh, we well here you see uh, uh, just some information about the book website, by the way, at the bottom there, uh, which, by the way, has more information, more photos, more stories, uh, and uh, virtually everything that's in the book itself, uh, plus more content, uh, as well as information on how to purchase the book and uh, other background information. Uh, so with that, and I see uh, Jimmy is with us again. Uh, I saw that there was uh, one question. Now I see there are two questions. Um, but maybe I could take the first question and Kathy could add, then she can take uh, the second question because I don't know the answer to the second question. <laughs> uh, so in, in regard to the first one, have recent events such as the Trump administration's xenophobic, xenophobic policies or the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic affected Chinatown? What does the future hold for the neighborhood? Uh, well, that's, uh, you know, that's the $64,000 question, as we used to say four decades ago. Um, and there's no question that the pandemic has affected uh, the businesses in Chinatown adversely. Uh, Chinatown was deserted actually a couple months before the lockdowns even occurred. Uh, and incorrectly, I think, well, tourism slowed down greatly. And I think 
people were afraid to come to Chinatown because, uh, partly because of the uh, what Trump was saying about uh, it being the Chinese flu and so on. There was a fear that people would be more likely to catch COVID-19 in Chinatown than they would anywhere else. Now, ironically, that's turned out to be totally false because Chinatown actually started taking precautions of uh, wearing masks uh, and social distancing uh, even before uh, it was required. And therefore the incidence rate in Chinatown is one of the lowest in San Francisco. And San Francisco, as you may know, is one of the lowest counties in California and in the nation. So uh, that was totally unfounded, but nevertheless, it had that economic impact. Uh, businesses are reopening in Chinatown now. As I mentioned, Kathy and I were just down there. A number of restaurants have created outdoor seating areas as they have in other parts of the city. Uh, and they're operating that way uh, through takeout and outdoor service. Uh, and some of the, many of the stores have been able to reopen, uh, although they are certainly not as busy as normal. And tourism, uh, of course, travel and tourism is just still very weak. Um, I think the lasting impact is going to be that some businesses, unfortunately, and particularly those that may be small family businesses and were not equipped to do any business online or, or uh, communicate online or, or, uh, or do a takeout example for restaurants, uh, unfortunately are gonna suffer uh, you know, probably a fatal blow and many may not reopen. Uh, but it's also encouraging there have been two or three new businesses who have actually come in and uh, reopened and more modern uh, uh, contemporary businesses, again, in the food sector. Uh, and I think once we're through this crisis, uh, we're certainly hoping that there will be a, a built up demand of people who've been missing their dim sum and roasted duck uh, and will be eager to get back there and enjoy the ambience and the, uh, the color and the culture in Chinatown. Uh, I don't know, Kathy, if you want to add anything on that first question before you take the second one. Just want to add that I think we should all go to Chinatown and uh, I plan to buy all my Christmas presents in Chinatown and I really challenge all of you to do the same to support this wonderful community because it won't survive without us supporting them in a very practical way. Um, either there's stores that you can do online shopping and uh, you could buy the book which goes directly to the culture center. Uh, the second question is where can you buy coffee crunch cake other than San Francisco? I don't know, but I did try to make it. I've made it before. You can find a recipe online because it's based on the Blum's coffee crunch cake. Blum's was an old San Francisco bakery way back and um, they were the first ones with this cake. So you can make it or you can go to Eastern Bakery. Let's see, it looks like there's, nope. Uh, no more open questions. Uh, Jimmy, do you have any questions? Uh, the lines are open actually. So anyone who wants to uh, unmute and give us a comment or ask a question, you're more than welcome to. And maybe let us know where you're calling in from. I think everyone's shy. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Kathy, Dick, just out of curiosity, if these um, individuals would like you to come and speak at their company or to their ERG or to one of the organizations they're involved with, um, how would they do that? Uh, well, uh, through you or through uh, our website, you'll see how to contact us through our publicist, uh, a woman named Andrea Burnett, who I think is actually on the call. Uh, so if you need any uh, details from Andrea, you can ask her right now, uh, but she's also listed on the website as well. Uh, she's been organizing our schedule so that we have one master schedule. We've done about more than 15 uh, book talks uh, already. Uh, we have another 15 or 20 scheduled throughout 
February, but we do have open times when we can uh, do it, particularly during the day. Uh, that's my phone and I'm gonna mute Kathy so you can pick up. So you can contact us, um, go through Jimmy. We'd be happy to come to your company, do a Zoom and um, yeah, we can do different versions of this presentation. We did a Q and A with Ben Fong Torres, uh, which was a little bit more curated. So uh, we're happy to to share our story with you. There's there's so much to tell. And if you have uh, someone uh, yourself or someone who would like to be uh, active in the presentation, like we we did, as Kathy mentioned, uh, Ben Fong Torres moderated a Q and A session that we had for the San Francisco Main Library and. Uh, it was well attended. I think we had 300 or so people sign up and a couple hundred in attendance. Uh, and uh, it was a very active back and forth with him asking some, uh, you know, some very challenging questions and um, probing beyond, uh, you know, some of the topics we've talked about. So if there's a particular interest uh, that your organization might have and want to set up the format, uh, in a particular way, we're happy to customize it for you. Looks uh, like there's another couple questions. So there's another question from Jason, um, which is, how can individuals get involved with furthering the education of the history, people, significance, et cetera, of San Francisco's Chinatown? Well, there are many nonprofits in Chinatown. <laughs> Probably has more nonprofits per capita than any uh, uh, neighborhood in in the city. Um, so I think uh, you know there are several that might be a good starting point. Uh, the Chinese Historical Society and Museum is one. The Chinese Culture Center, who we partnered with, is another one. Uh, and I'm sure there are some other. Uh, organizations that would be good with that. Um, I would and, start with the CHSA. Yeah. The yeah, I think. So. Yeah, and it's also, you know, as as we've said, uh, we're happy to uh, to do uh, talks about the book and the content, and to share the content that we have in the book and on the website. Um, I would encourage you go to the website, and again, it's ChinatownBookSF.com. Uh, you'll see that there's a section on the history of Chinatown, which goes into more detail uh, than you will find in the book. Uh, there's also more images of Chinatown. Uh, there are 20 plus stories that Kathy's put together, uh, quite short stories, uh, but about many uh, important and interesting aspects uh, of Chinatown. And if you read those stories, that might tweak your interest uh, as to specific aspects uh, on which you would like to follow up. It's amazing because so many people have come out of Chinatown that are just tops in their fields. Um, one of the gals that was rescued from uh, Cameron House, she uh, was rescued by Cameron House, and she was Stanford's first female a uh, Chinese female graduate. Her name is Bessie Joan, and she became a medical doctor. So just a lot of neat, really neat tidbits about Chinatown. It's a very layered history. So if you guys do a deep dive, it, it's a very deep dive, but it's really a fun dive too. Awesome, and to kind of add on to that from my perspective, I think if you're interested in learning more, there's always the resources that um, Kathy and Dick has provided. Um, I think if you want to help educate or get others to know, um, PBS did an amazing piece on Asian Americans, which highlights a lot yes. of history that happened in Chinatown, but numerous other communities. And whether you are interested in watching that, I think it's a five part series. It's really, really educational. Or even having it shared with friends and family or your ERGs and um, your peers at work. And so those are other areas in which you could learn more about, you know, the, the Asian struggle and the things that our multiple different communities within the Asian community has done um, to make try lives better for everybody. I see there's another question here. What was the process of choosing Chinatown versus another neighborhood of San Francisco? 
uh, as I think Jimmy mentioned, uh, this is the third book I've done, uh, third documentary photography book on neighborhoods of San Francisco. The first one was on Haight-Ashbury. Uh, and that was just uh, coincidental because my daughter and son-in-law own the bookstore in Haight-Ashbury. So I got interested in that neighborhood. And of course, it has a fabulous history going back to the summer of love and uh, that period. So, uh, so that got me started with doing the Haight-Ashbury book. And then uh, it was well received and people loved it. And, and I had a lot of people ask, what's the next neighborhood? Uh, so I would uh, turn the question around and say, what do you think is an interesting neighborhood? Many people came back and said the mission, uh, the Latino neighborhood, of course, in San Francisco, because it's going through so much uh, social turmoil now, gentrification. It's an extremely colorful neighborhood with all the murals and uh, and the uh, immigration issues going on uh, and all of that. So that became my second project. Uh, and I partnered with Proceda Eyes, which is the muralist organization uh, within uh, the mission. Um, and then as, the, as I was wrapping that one up and it was doing well and is now in its third printing, uh, again, uh, I would ask people, you know, what do you think is a good neighborhood to do next? And a number of people mentioned Chinatown. And as I thought about it, uh, I said that would be perfect because it's, it's quite compact actually, 24 square blocks. So, <laughs> but it's just jam packed with uh, photo opportunities and stories and history. And it's dealing with a lot of the same social justice, housing, gentrification, challenges, uh, discrimination. Uh, it's just so rich in terms of culture and history, that it would be a wonderful case to do. And uh, I was looking for someone to work with as a co-author. Uh, and I saw a very well-written piece in the New York Times uh, that Kathy had done. And so I set about with the help of the Chinese Culture Center, finding Kathy and seeing where she was located. And sure enough, fortunately, she was located in the Bay Area. So even though she thought that our first approach to her was a scam email. Nevertheless, fortunately, she did answer it. And that's how we got together. Awesome. Is there anyone have any other questions? Like I said, feel free to unmute or feel free to unmute yourself and you can say it or if you want to post it in chat or a question. We're happy to answer. All right, so um, if you have questions, feel free to post it, but I'm gonna close up a little bit and if there's questions afterwards, we can continue forward. But uh, first off, I would like to thank everybody here. I also would love to especially thank um, Kathy, Dick, Laura, and Andrea to actually make this happen. I think it was a lot of valuable information, a lot of interesting in um, history and knowledge behind the photos and everything that we saw. Um, and again, you know, this is great. This is um, something that is really good to get out there for people to know um, the histories and seeing the imagery around the community, et cetera. Um, for anyone on the call, if you're interested, like I said, um, to have um, Kathy or Richard talk to your um, to the employees of your company, to your ERGs, feel free to reach Andrea, which is actually her emails in the chat, or you're welcome to email me at um, leadership at asianleadersalliance.com, or you could go to our website, asianleadersalliance.com, and um, there's a way to contact us there. Um, the idea of these things is to actually help expose the ERG leadership and others to organizations and individuals that can come and talk to you, your ERGs and your employees about stuff in the community and things of importance. And so hopefully this is not the last, but um, we are actually planning to do things with Dick and Kathy later on. So look forward to that. We're hopefully trying to aim it towards um, Q1 or Q2 of next year. And if anything, um, we'll have a recording of this and hopefully I'll post it on our Asian Leaders Alliance and Medium publication and our YouTube. Great, well, thank you very much for everyone attending. Thank you, Jimmy, for organizing it.
And we hope to run into some of you sometime in the future. Awesome. Thanks for and having it, us. And it looks like there's a quick question of where's your guys' favorite place to go in Chinatown? Oh, um, well, I mean, it depends what you want to do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, I mean, one of the ones that uh, was really uh, interesting, I thought, was to go inside one of the uh, family associations. And of course, as a, the public at large doesn't get that opportunity. We had to organize it ahead of time, but to go inside and see their boardroom and their altars and uh, the pictures of the elders on the walls, that was interesting. I think Kathy enjoyed going back into the abandoned Great Star Theater, right? Because you used to go to movies there. Yeah, that was a bad little spooky. I really love the underground uh, restaurants and those are real treasures of San Francisco. So if you ever get a chance to go, you take the stairs going down, they're basement restaurants. There's maybe like three or four left, but uh, try them. You get a nice plate lunch for under 10 bucks. <laughs> I think it's great. But just walking down Grant Street, you know, from one end to the other of Grant Street, uh, there's just a plethora of, of shops. And, and when things, you know, are not in a COVID period, uh, you know, it's lively at nighttime. It's a great place to be. A lot going on, all kinds of shops, all kinds of food. Uh, or if you prefer going to the markets where the locals actually shop, go to Stockton Street. Uh, the last couple of box, blocks of Stockton near Broadway. Uh, you see all of the food markets and everything uh, uh, out there and uh, very good produce, I have to say, and a huge variety. Thanks so much for hosting us, guys. Awesome. Thank you very much, Richard, Kathy, or, um, Laura, um, Andrea, for doing this. And thank you all that's been able to join us tonight. And you have a good evening. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Bye.